when we think about personalities, we often like look out for what's different or what's odd about that person. But actually, everyone has a very unique personality. Mm. And very often, there is not like one good personality. There's no correct personality. Can I absolutely hate someone's work personality but still respect and work well with them? Mm, you have an example. <laughs> in your mind, you sound like you have an example in your mind. We have to remember that there's always two sides to us. Like one side of us, which is we are able to give and that's our left hand. And the other side of us is what we desire for ourselves, what comes naturally, that's our right hand. We need both the left and the right hand to thrive in the workplace. Are you an INFJ? ENFP? The loyalist? The reformer? the investigator, or do you simply have no idea what I'm talking about? Hi, you're back on the Work It podcast with Tiffany and Gerald, and today we want to talk about workplace personalities and how that shows up at work and when you are searching for a job. So today it's just me and Tiffany in the studio, but we thought that this would be a very interesting topic that Mm. we can talk and share more about because in my line of career counselling, I often hear people talk about changing their work Mm. and the motivation of their thoughts of changing sometimes comes from different places, right? Whether there are changes in their lives, changes within them. And one big one is really challenges with the workplaces. Ah, yes. So today we want to talk a little bit about how personalities can actually clash at the workplace when co-workers don't understand each other. Before I started researching this topic, I used to think that if I have a conflict with a co-worker, I would explain it away as maybe we just have different working styles. So you are saying that it probably has to do with our own personalities and how we communicate and deal with things. So in preparation for this episode, Gerald got me to do two tests. One is a personality test and the other is to help me see what jobs I can consider if I'm planning on switching. I must admit, I didn't think you could use that information to job search. Mm, Okay, then what do you think we need to use to do job search? I just thought it boils down to skills, interests, salary obviously is a big one, and career trajectory. I mean, these are kind of the markers that I will use when I am looking for another job. I didn't think that I could use personality as a way to gauge whether the next job would be suitable. Beyond covering what you just said about the skills, preferences, personality is also a very important part to consider because people work with people. Ah, okay. Yeah, their personalities in the environment, in the workplaces, and it creates a certain culture. And culture also someone clashes with our behaviours. So it's pretty useful and important to also maybe consider our personalities, even as we are thinking about what kind of jobs would be suitable for us. Yeah. So for example, right, a doctor with certain kinds of personality, maybe a very outgoing personality, okay. loves to chat with people, yeah. uh, loves to tell jokes and have interaction. Yeah, my GP is that kind of person. Yeah, so a person who has the skills to be a doctor, but has a personality that's very extroverted and very sunshine kind, you know, you might think that if the doctor is a surgeon, oh, okay, then maybe that personality doesn't quite fit very well. Yeah, because who is he going to talk to yeah. with the person that is lying unconscious on the surgery table, right? Yeah, so maybe the doctor with that kind of personality would be good as a maybe a GP because you see patients every few minutes, a different patient, maybe working in palliative care, mm. right? Or even working with children in pediatrics. Yeah. So maybe let's start from the top. What is a personality and how can you tell the personality of a person? In a previous episode, we talked about introversion and extroversion. Mm-hmm. And I'm assuming that there's more to just introversion and extroversion. Yeah. So when we talk about personality, what we're really looking for is a person's characteristics okay. and behavior that is kind of consistent and enduring which means that it shows up consistently under different situations and scenarios. Mm. So this development of a person's personality it has started throughout the person's life. Okay, It's something that in the moment they are born, they already have a set of genes that yes. also already kind of predicts or makes them behave a certain way. And then over the lifespan of their time, they have this nurture perspective yes. right, where things that happen, environment, influences, and then it slowly shapes a person's personality to make them behave and react and think, act a certain way right now. So when sometimes when we see a person, we say, ah, the person, the character is like that one. Ah, yes. It sounds very dismissive, yeah. actually. But what often happens is, if we know how to handle personalities well, then it becomes quite useful. What I mean by handle personalities well is when we are able to know ourselves, our personalities, amplify it. 
so that we get advantages, so that we can play up our strengths, perform well. Yeah. Also, to be aware of our personalities, to recognize blind spots for ourselves. For example, what do we tend to not do so well in? Mm. What kind of situations will bring out the worst in us? Mm. And lastly, also learning about other people's personalities and learning to collaborate. Uh, How yes. do we adapt and help each other? Yeah. Mm. You got me to do the big five personality tests. Mm. And we can run through very briefly on that. So we'll talk about openness. It describes a person's tendency to think in complex or abstract ways. Mm-hmm. And then we have the conscientiousness. conscientiousness. So conscientiousness, how would you describe conscientiousness? It's people who are really very detailed. Okay. They like structure, they follow plans. Yes. And for people who are conscientious, they really are hardworking. They're able to focus very much on the details. And then we have extroversion. So it's whether you're extroverted and introvert. The way we use our energy, right? Yes, the way we use our energy, the way we retrieve our energy as well. And then we have the fourth one is agreeableness. So agreeableness, am I right to say that it's about how you would agree with the people around you. Is that really what it means? Yeah. So how likely are you to go along with the flow, with ideas, with things that people say? Okay. Are you more likely to resist? Okay. Or are you more go with the flow? And then the fifth one is neurotism, mm. which is how well you react to stress mm, and yes. change, right? The word itself is like, a lot of people feel like, oh, I shouldn't be like that, right? But, yeah. you know, we all have different levels of neurotism. Yes. Right? Yeah. It's yes. basically how stable are we when things change, when things are not going according to plan. Yes. Mm. And I think it's a good point to note here that all the five things that we just said, it's not like a whether you fail or pass, Mm-mm. right? It's a spectrum. Everything is a spectrum. So you can be extremely high on neurotism or you can be somewhat in the middle. Yes. Okay, so... Do your personality types change as you grow older? Mm. The reason why I'm asking is because I think when I was younger, I would probably be a little bit more agreeable. I would maybe be more open. Mm. But then as I grow older, I feel that because I kind of know what am I good at Mm. and what I don't like. And that's part of me, I guess, like sort of setting boundaries as well. Does my personality then change as I grow older? Yeah. So from research standpoint of view, the personality of a person is pretty stable as they grow, which means that it doesn't change drastically. Mm. But more recent research has also shown that there is some little bit of space for change, mm. especially if today a person goes through very life-changing events, okay, very momentous kind of events have happened yeah. or traumatic events. It can change a person's personality in a big way. Mm. Mm. Let's talk about how we can better collaborate or maybe avoid conflict right, with our team members. Because let's say, for example, you're in a very small team and that maybe many people in this team, let's say four out of five people in this team are extroverts and they are not not very great with details. And then you have that one person who (laughs) is more introverted, maybe prefers a bit more structure in meetings and everything. You said, oh no, because I'm also thinking, oh no, automatically I'm thinking that one person would be honestly suffering, right? Yeah, the one person will feel pretty out of place because the dominant culture, the dominant styles of working, it's very different from what he or she is used to. Yeah. Mm. So how then would you say best advise a person like this to work as part of this team you can't fully avoid conflicts but how can you maybe reduce the frequency of it yep so for example even recognizing that it's difficult for that person that's already a very good step recognizing that you're different but different doesn't mean bad yeah so in understanding like okay maybe we are more like this the way we are doing work is let's say less detailed but this person really values details a lot So then it's about how do we tone down for the person to tone up certain things and we can tone down certain things. Mm. We need to meet in the middle somewhere. Mm. Yeah. So what I mean is, for example, slowing down the extrovertedness and the idea generation and really just saying that, okay, we need to put some of these points down and we need to put like a plan in place so that our whole team can benefit from it. And then for the person who's on his or her own to also step up and maybe use their strengths of planning. Mm. to help to say, okay, this is what I think needs to go into the plan. What we need to do is this and that and this and that. So you're making use of each other's strengths. You are adjusting to accommodate each other, each other's styles as well, so that the relationship will become stronger and better. Yeah. When you were just talking about that, I thought of an experience that I actually had. So I used to work with a colleague very closely and this colleague is very low on the detail and the structure. Mm. Very good with the big picture. So very good with saying, okay, this is what we're going to try and achieve and then we're going to try and get there. But I felt so uncomfortable at the start. I was actually very annoyed with this person. Mm. I would always cringe when the boss says, okay, I'm going to put two of you together on this project because I'll be like, 
you know what? You're just going to make me do all the menial labor. Eventually, when I found out that, okay, this person's not very high on making sure that there are processes in place, I started to see my role a little bit differently. Mm. So in a way, it helped me to complement this person a lot better. Yeah. And it allowed me to then set aside the part of my brain that would try and think big picture because I'll be like, okay, give me your vision mm. and then I will try and help you to get there. Yep. And that's a really good example, Tiffany, of how that partnership works, right? It's not to say that my personality is like this, so I must do jobs that are like this. We want to see how we can complement yeah. Where can we cover gaps? Some people are maybe naturally better at certain things. Let them do those things. And for you, if you are more balanced in other areas as well, you could also bring that up into that working relationship, mm. right? But also having said that, if today this example of yours were to stretch and you're working with many people yeah. who are very big picture and they say, Tiffany, you're great at planning. <laughs> I would be very pretty upset. <laughs> and then now honest. you're just going to be the planner for every team, I every project. not sure I'll be happy, Gerard, honestly, because... I really will feel that everybody's just treating me like the tea lady. Yeah. So this is where we start to see the personality styles as what I use as an analogy, like our right hand and our left hand. So like what you just described, your right hand is really that big picture thinking, that ideation that you have. And then the left hand is maybe doing all the planning. The way you describe it as menial work, right? Like booking calendars, sourcing for venues. When someone comes in with that big picture and the person's really poor on the things that you can do with your left hand, then what you're trying to do is, okay, then I will complement the relationship, the working partnership with my left hand. Mm. And you keep using your left hand over and over again. And then people recognize you for your expertise mm. in the things that you do with your left hand. But then I also will feel very pigeonholed. Mm. I'll feel that, oh, okay, well, it's good that I'm very good at this, but that may not be the career that I want to develop in, right? Yes, exactly. So at some point of time, when you mentioned like, if this goes on, you feel like you cannot, you just feel like a tea lady because your right hand, you're not, kind of working on what's naturally coming to you. Yes. What you prefer more of, the things on your right hand. So very much often, we need to find a way to kind of shift back towards things that we can show and do with our right hand. Mm. Because in the working world, really, there are many people who are actually doing things that they don't really like, yeah. but they're told that they're good at. Yes, absolutely true. I was in a similar situation before. And when that happens slowly, it becomes the things that you are known to be good for People define you by that. They assess you by that. But actually, that's not... That's not what you want to yes. do. Yeah, that's not what you sign up for. Correct. So I think when we think about personalities, and this also applies to our interests, our preferences, we have to remember that there's always two sides to us. Like one side of us, which is we are able to give, we are able to accommodate, and that's our left hand. And the other side of us is what we want, what we desire for ourselves, what comes naturally, what our strengths, that's our right hand. So if today we can balance the two together, we need both the left and the right hand to thrive in the workplace, then that'll be great. Which brings me to the next point that I want to say here. I think it's also about meeting halfway, mm. right? Even the way we work on this podcast, Gerald, mm. is like, I know <laughs> what you are good at. I know what may not come so naturally for you. And likewise for myself as well, you know what it is. And because we know how each other work, we talk about it and I say, okay, Gerald, I need you to maybe come down to my level a little bit and I will try and meet you there. Mm. And I think between two people, when you have that conversation and you agree to meet halfway, I think things can work better. Yes. But I think the problem that maybe a lot of people might face in the workplace is the other person is not interested to yeah. meet me halfway. Correct. And this is the reason why there are a lot of clashes, why people feel like they need to leave their jobs. They don't want to stay on in a work because they feel like, I'm not getting anywhere. The one who's giving, right? Yeah. It's like a relationship. And the other people are not helping me. So this is very common. And it sometimes goes beyond the personality of a person. It's the willingness also to want to like say, I want to accommodate. I want to tone down certain things. I want to play up certain things because I know this is needed of me in a team. And the other person is doing this, adding his or her contribution in a team in this other way. Yeah. Then when the work gets done, Everybody feels like, okay, we contributed to it. And I have grown also in areas that I otherwise would not naturally have yes, grown, right? Because yes. my colleague has pushed me out into a zone that is a little bit uncomfortable, but not too uncomfortable. So that's also growth. Correct. So remember that's what I said about how there's the nature and nurture perspective of personality. Mm -hmm. So the nurturing part comes from the environment. And of course, in the workplace, it's also another stage or environment where our personalities continue to be stretched, mm. to continue to be refined through little, little things like that. So it's very important for us, right, to remember that our personalities are malleable. Can I absolutely hate someone's work personality, but still respect and work well with them? Mm, you have an example. In your mind, you sound like you have an example in your mind. <laughs> yes, I mean, I've worked with people who I really, really don't like the way that they treat other people because, okay, I'm quite high on the social aspect, right? It's very big for me on respect and that's why I teach my kids as well. 
And I have worked with people who are not very respectful to people's feelings and their opinions, but they're very good at areas that I am not good at. Mm. So it's one of those, I can work with you, but I cannot marry you kind of situation. But at the same time, I respect you because you have the qualities or the things that I'm not good at. I think every human being is not perfect, mm. right? We all have our own weak spots. But what you also pointed out is we also have our strengths. Mm. And some of these strengths really can appear as really, really good things to help in a team, help in the work that we do. So when we learn to see people maybe more for what they can do, mm. and then we start from there in the workplace especially, and not focus too much on like what the person is not or where the person is failing, then that's where the relationship has the foundation to start to build. Maybe over time, you start to realize there are reasons for why the person is not good at certain things, okay. right? or why the person behaves a certain way. And then that brings further understanding. But in the work context, very much often is what can we do together? Why are you in this team? And what can you bring to the table? What can you offer? How can you fit in? If I have to work on a project view, how are we going to work with each other? For example, would you prefer to have everything be done over emails? Mm. Or will you be okay if we are like just texting over using the phone? Yeah. Are you okay with after office hours engagement? And if today there's something that you want to say and you kind of disagree with me, how would you like me to respond if today you say it? Yes. If I want feedback, how should I ask it from you? In fact, I remember that was something that you spoke to me about. <laughs> you told me that like I like feedback. And I would like you to be honest with me. Tell me what are the areas I can work at. So it was very clear for me that, okay, Gerald will not thrive if I just say, okay, this is what you're bad, this is what you're bad at. But start with the what are areas that we can do better. And that also taught me as well. Like It made me go think to myself, oh, okay, how would I also like to get feedback? Correct. So like, for example, asking for feedback, just on that specific example, we can go further by telling the person, why is the feedback important to us? Mm. And maybe that person will understand what kind of feedback. Like, for example, is it qualitative feedback? Is it quantitative feedback? Are you looking for areas to improve? Or are you just looking for like what you did well? Yes. Because you need your affirmation. Yeah. So I think we can clarify some of these things in a working relationship. Have you seen instances where companies make job applicants do these personality tests? Mm -mm. Could they in some form be a way that could discriminate potential job hires? If employers out there are using any form of personality tool to make hiring decisions solely based on the test, then I think it's a bit too much of a stretch to hinge your hiring decision on that one test result. Okay. So what we often see is employers would use a battery, right, of different methods mm. to assess a candidate. What are they assessing? For example, during the interview, they will be asking the candidate for like their experiences. They might put a person through a competency test mm. and then maybe layer on, let's say, a personality assessment. So they want to know whether or not your personality fits the job. Mm. Okay. Or rather, like for example, certain jobs may require certain kinds of personalities. For example, if you are entering leadership roles, you need to steer a very large company. Your levels of neurotism needs to be high or low? Low. Oh, yes. Because okay, you, because have, to you be have to handle stable. stress. Yes. Yeah, you have to handle stress. You have to handle a very busy life. And there are a lot of things that are clamoring for your attention. Okay. So I know that all these tests sometimes gives the recruiter more confidence in terms of confirming a client. But there are people who I guess would easily lie in these mm. personality tests. Oh, because yes. I remember it's a spectrum, right? You can have five different options like from strongly disagree to strongly agree. And then... I imagine some people might not be comfortable in disclosing, but then you ask me to do it anyway, so I just put everything neutral. <laughs> yes. It's possible, right? Yes, and we have seen this many times. Okay. People who are forced to take certain tests and they don't feel personally comfortable to disclose mm. themselves, so then they will just put in a neutral or give very extreme scores. Mm. And some of these tests, they will actually flag out to say that, you know what, this person's report may not be accurate because of the way the person responded. And it doesn't reflect very well on the job applicant, right? Because it looks like as if they have something to hide. Mm, yeah, because it's incomplete. Yeah. But like I said, maybe if today the candidate has proven him or herself in other areas, like other data points are strong, then maybe sometimes even that personality assessment may not be the veto factor. And in fact, most of the jobs, they wouldn't do this because it's a cost yeah, on yeah. employers. So very quickly, I just want to talk about understanding yourself in your job search. You got me to do this self-directed search. Mm, the RISAC, Holland's RISAC codes. So that also allowed me to also see, okay, what are the types of jobs I would maybe thrive better at, right? So why is it important to understand our personality type when we are searching for the next job? So it's about understanding what comes naturally to us, our right hand. Oh, okay. And then also what we have on our left hand, mm. right? That may not be so natural, but we can still do. So for example, we look at John Holland's RISAC codes, and this is something that actually all Singaporeans get access to for free. Oh. Yeah, it's on the MySkill 
use future portal. Oh, so <laughs> every everybody, Singaporean can do it. Yes, please, please, please. And log go in and, and can do it. just do it, right? Okay. So we do the test, we can start to understand what are two or three dominant codes that we have. And this gives us a certain signal or clue about like what are we naturally interested in and what can we do well. Okay. So when we are looking for a job, we start to understand, oh, now I understand why certain type of jobs will fit me better and certain type of jobs I should avoid. Mm. So for example, the RISER assessment, there are six codes, R-I-A-S-E-C. And it's a realistic, investigative, artistic, social, enterprising, and conventional. So like for example, the doctor we talked about earlier, the sunshine doctor, right? That's maybe a social person. Mm. Social attributes very high. Maybe the sense of enterprising is very high. They enjoy leading things, making people happy, coming up with activities to engage their patients, for example. Then that could help you to understand, oh, okay, for me, I'm a social and enterprising. So maybe I can see this other job. It requires that kind of qualities and I can go into that. Okay. So for Holland's Rise That Code, it's interesting because it takes our personality more into this workspace and we are able to use it to not just understand ourselves better, but we can also understand the job better. Ah, uh, yes, that's true. So we can try to find a match, a fit between what we are doing and whether the job would be a good environment and the task would be a good fit for us. Yes. So for example, if today you are with a very social and very artistic, you like freedom, you like the expression, you like arts, right? And I ask you, oh, be an auditor. Mm, I don't think, yeah. I mean, straight away, I can tell you that it's not going to be a good job fit, right? Yeah. I don't think you're going to stay very long in the job. Yes. So when we look at that, straight away, you're able to pick up like, oh no, it's difficult, right? Because we have certain ideas of what auditors are like. Mm -hmm. So using the RISAC theory, the frame this understanding, we can see, oh, Actually, an auditor requires different type of codes. Okay. So if I were to do an auditor job, it's not like you cannot do it. And this is for all those out there who are taking audit work <laughs> and you are like, you know... Because they have spent four years <laughs> in university and they're like, oh no, Gerald, what are you trying to say? Yeah. But it just means that you've been working with your left hand. Mm. Right? You've been working with your left hand and there must be a way somehow for the things on the right hand, right, to be expressed. Mm. Either in some form of work or in your personal life. Yeah. There must be some outlet. Yeah, you know? correct. So like, for example, an auditor might say, you know what, I like to meet people, right? Can I, don't just stay in the office. Can I like go out to interview? Yes. And these are usually the auditors that people would love to talk to because they are very friendly. You know, you think auditors just throw the book at you, right? Yeah. But these guys, they are understanding. They say, I'm here to help you to pass your audit. Yeah. I think we have spoken quite in depth and in detail about how your personality types can help you to avoid certain type of conflicts, can help you to collaborate better with the people in your team. But also at the same time, if you're looking for a job, Knowing yourself better will help you to be a bit more focused in your job search. If you are currently in a job where you are thinking, oh, I'm not sure whether is this really what I want, but the pay is really good and I can see me staying here for the next five years. It's okay. You can mm -hmm. still stay on, but at the same time, maybe find other avenues within the company that helps you to stretch that natural ability mm. that you have. Yeah, absolutely. So go and try out the RISAC test, which is available on the MySkillsFuture portal. Yes. And after you find that out and if you feel that like, you know what, this is really something that I want to work on, you can even use your SkillsFuture credits to go and upgrade. Yeah. So hopefully our conversation today, it will inspire something. Hi, it's our Ask Me Anything segment again, and usually we get a variety of questions from you. But today, we have two listeners who actually sent a very similar question. So this must be something a lot of you are facing. Our listeners, Leo and Mike, they are in two different sectors, but both of them are wondering how can they appear less of a threat to colleagues who are not so career-focused? Now, Leo says that he doesn't want to be seen as spoiling the market or setting the bar too high for his fellow colleagues. He wants their respect, but doesn't want to be perceived as a threat. Mike, too, says he tries to increase his visibility by volunteering for projects and networking with department heads. But sometimes, funny enough, he has had to lie to his peers that his supervisor nominated him for the projects and pretends that he's actually quite unwilling to do this. So, Gerald, I think this is actually a very real situation, especially I feel among young people. They're ambitious in a good way, but they worry about being seen as a threat. So let's talk about how we can navigate this situation better. I agree with what you said, Tiffany, that it's good to be ambitious. It's not a bad thing for sure. But what happens very often is we don't want people to know about our ambition or rather don't want people to know that the only thing we are aiming for is that ambition. You yeah, know? that we want it so badly. We're yes. so desperate. We want to be eventually their boss. So everyone has some form of ambition, I would believe. 
either it's very clear or it's just like hidden very deeply. Yeah. So everyone has their ambition. So I guess it's good to talk about this. I mean, I personally think that it's okay to own your ambition. Be proud of it because ultimately this is your career, mm-hmm. right? I feel that in our casual conversations with your peers, you can sort of say you're enjoying the role or the project a lot. And actually your positivity might rub off them. So even if they're not very career focused, they might go, hey, actually Gerald is taking this job very seriously and he has good ideas. Next time when you put your hand up for for extra work. I don't think it will come off as a surprise to any of them. Mm. But it's important that you're not stepping on other people on your way up. Yeah. There are a lot of people who in their pursuit of their ambition, they don't mind to leave people dead in their footsteps. Yeah, you see this yeah. trail of bodies. So some of these things, from my experiences, they look like people who discredit others uh. when they have done the work, all right, or stealing their credit, bad mouthing, backstabbing, people gossiping behind their backs so that you look better. And I've mm-hmm. also seen this one where constantly bothering HR like how do I get promoted what are my peers paid where am I on the benchmark mm. I would use the word harass because it's like they go back so often and they ask these questions expecting a good answer Yeah. and then when they find that it's not equitable by them right, they start to demand things yes what are other good ways that we can show ambition without rubbing people off the wrong way very importantly be a team player mm. the more you think about wanting to climb or wanting to progress on your own then you're already starting to think more for yourself and then others. Be a team player. Start to look out for people on the team. Usually, those of us who have a bit more ambition, I would say we are also more confident in our work. We are more competent. We feel like we can perform. That's why we want to fly. Yes. Right. But take a look at the people on the team. Maybe there are some of them who are really struggling. True. People who are not able to be on point with their work. You want to look out for them a little bit more. And that could also be a reason why they're not career focused because they feel there's a limit to what I can do. Yeah, so if today you're climbing the corporate ladder, you eventually will have to lead a team. This is also what you have to do anyway, which is to look out for everyone in a team, right? There's a saying about how the weakest person on team will determine the overall quality and the strength of the team. That's true. So if today you want to kind of progress, you are out to look out for ambition, look out for the small guys on the team, mm. all right? Of course, do your work well. Yeah. Don't downplay other people's achievements. In fact, what you can do, you play them up as a team together. So when people look at you, you become that more personable employee. And even if they know that you are ambitious and they say, wow, you're very ambitious, huh? then learn to do that statement. Say yes. Say thanks for acknowledging that. Thanks for observing that. The <laughs> typical Asian culture is no la, no la, no la, no la. So we want to kind of avoid that. We want to say, that, yeah, I really enjoy what I do. And what I'm doing here, in fact, the reason why we can get results is because of everyone. Yes. I think it makes everyone on the team feel better. And more importantly, when the time comes, if you are given the opportunity to be the leader, these are the people who are going to be your trusted right and left hand men and women, yes, right? correct. I I think when you succeed, you want people to feel like they are part of your success as well. Mm. So you're bringing along the team to the finish line rather than just running there by yourself as yeah. a winner. I think it's okay to tell your boss to say, I would like to you know, work on maybe some leadership qualities. If you have any courses, if you have any training, let me be able to go for that. And then if your friends maybe during lunch and say, hey, I heard that you asked boss do this for you. Just say, yeah, because this is something that I can see myself progressing in. And more importantly, if that's what you want to do as well, come and join me. Yeah, exactly. What we want to do is to make sure that there's open access it's not exclusive yeah right so offer your ideas of like how you are also trying to pursue your ambition i know some companies they don't like to do this like all their high potentials they will try to keep it very hush hush mm. but if you are a high potential person inside the company then you could either be seen as like okay i'm the elite and i don't mix with you or you could say that you know what i'm sharing what i know from this with the rest of you as well i'm no different from all of you yeah 